Hello and welcome to our next lecture in physiological psychology. Today we're going to be talking about movement disorders. Uh, first I want to apologize, I have a pretty bad cold, so if I have to cough in the middle of this or if my voice sounds a little raspy, that would be why. So uh, we'll be talking about, sort of broadly speaking, some of the more um, prominent movement disorders. Of course, Parkinson's disease is something most people have heard of. Uh, Michael J. Fox and uh, Muhammad Ali, of course, uh, famously uh, suffering from this particular disease. Uh, we'll also talk about Huntington's disease, which is uh, an entirely chromosomal disorder, uh, so it's entirely genetic. Uh, we'll talk about Tourette's, uh, ALS, and a little bit about some cortical disorders like apraxia. So we'll start with Parkinson's disease, and we'll start with some symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so this is a movement disorder characterized by muscle tremors, rigidity, slow movements, and difficulty initiating, initiating physical and mental activity. One of the problems with Parkinson's disease is uh, the parts of the brain involved uh, in uh, this disease are the basal ganglia. And as we've talked in previous lectures, the basal ganglia work through these series of excitatory and inhibitory connections. So in some instances, Parkinson's disease patients can't stop moving, so they have tremors. Um, but they also have difficulty initiating movements because they can't get enough excitation or have too much inhibition because they don't have enough excitation. So the system gets out of balance. So this is an associated with an impairment in initiating spontaneous movement in the absence of stimuli to guide the action. So some of you may have seen um, the movie Awakenings, um, where um, Oliver Sacks, who's played by Robin Williams, um, adds some um, visual stimuli uh, to patients to follow. Um, you also may have seen uh, patients, if they're given a metronome to walk to, uh, they can actually uh, guide their movements to the metronome. So uh, there, I it's a difficulty in just simply purely self-initiated movement. That seems to be one of the biggest problems. There are, of course, additional symptoms, which include depression, uh, memory and reasoning deficits, uh, loss of olfaction, and other cognitive deficits. So as neurons degrade uh, because of this disease, we start to see losses of other um, functions as well. And so this isn't just motor um, coordination that's lost. Uh, there are other cognitive and emotional deficits that occur as well, um, particularly as this degree disease progresses. In terms of the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, <coughs> excuse me, it's caused by a gradual and progressive death of neurons, particularly in the substantia nigra. And in particular, the dopamine, uh, dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra usually sends dopamine release and axons to the caudate nucleus and the putamen. But the loss of this dopamine leads to less stimulation of the motor cortex and slower onset of movement. So this is a very complex picture in terms of how Parkinson's disease has its effect on the motor system because we're talking about uh, this very delicately balanced system in the um, basal ganglia. So if you recall from our previous lectures, uh, the substantia nigra uh, excites the putamen, which inhibits the thalamus, which then excites, or excites the cerebral cortex. So if the substantia nigra is not exciting the putamen, the putamen is then over inhibiting the thalamus and that it is no longer, sorry, and the globus pilatus is in here in the middle, so the vitamin inhibits the globus pilatus, which then inhibits the thalamus. So without this, um, without this increased excitation and increased inhibition, then we get less excitation um, of the cerebral cortex. So it's a very complicated system. So we get decreased excitation, decreased inhibition. So here's where the system gets out of whack because it's not inhibiting the globus pilatus anymore, so it has increased inhibition, uh, and as a result, we get less excitation to the cerebral cortex from the thalamus. This is the reason why <coughs> some patients are treated with what's called a global or with a pallidotomy, where they actually remove part of the globus pilatus so that we get rid of this uh, level of inhibition to the thalamus and can still get excitation to the cortex. Now, that's not without difficulty as well. So the etiology or causal factors involved with Parkinson's disease, um, studies suggest early onset Parkinson's has a genetic link. But genetic factors are only a small factor of late onset Parkinson's disease. So if you uh, develop Parkinson's disease after 50, uh, there is much lower uh, probability that this is actually a genetic uh, disease. 
We do believe uh, that environmental influences such as exposure to toxins, including insecticides, herbicides, and fungus fungicides may have um, some significant influence in the causal factors involved with Parkinson's disease. And so oftentimes you see elevated Parkinson's disease in farm workers and people who are uh, oftentimes exposed to these um, toxic substances. We also know that traumatic head injury seems to be a risk factor for Parkinson's dis disease as well. Uh, this is probably part of the causal factors behind Muhammad Ali's uh, Parkinson's disease. Obviously boxing results in a pretty significant traumatic head injury. Interestingly, cigarette smoking and coffee drinking are actually related to a decreased chance of developing Parkinson's disease. Now, I don't suggest taking up cigarette smoking uh, or coffee drinking. <laughs> well, coffee drinking probably is fine. There's lots of benefits to moderate coffee drinking, but there are no benefits to cigarette smoking, and the costs certainly outweigh <coughs> excuse me, any potential benefit you might get from cigarette smoking. And there may be some genetic factors that co-occur with that cigarette smoking. Um, finally, damaged mitochondria of cells seems to be a common to most factors that increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. So anything that damages cell mitochondria, or perhaps, so if it damages mitochondria, increases the risk for Parkinson's disease, and then anything that might be protect protective of mitochondria may actually be part of the um, reason why some people are at lower risk for Parkinson's disease. In terms of treatment for Parkinson's disease, um, there are a number of different uh, treatments that are ongoing testing. The sort of go-to old, oldest treatment is the drug L-DOPA, um, which is the primary treatment for Parkinson's, uh, which is a precursor to dopamine that easily crosses the blood-brain barrier. This is often ineffective, particularly for those in the later stages of the disease. It does not prevent the continued loss of neurons. It simply supplements some of the loss of that neurons. And it also enters other brain cells and can produce unpleasant side effects. In fact, it can cause schizophrenia-like symptoms in patients um, because of this uh, over-elevation in dopamine. Other treatments include drugs that stimulate uh, dopamine receptors directly, uh, implanting electrodes to stimulate areas deep in the brain. This is one of the sort of latest treatments that seems to have a lot of promise. Uh, in a pallidotomy, as I was mentioned earlier, the surgeon destroys a tiny part of the globus pallidus by creating a scar. This reduces the brain activity in that area, which may help relieve movement symptoms such as tremor and stiffness or rigidity. So it can be helpful in those instances. Uh, my understanding, although I'm not entirely sure about this, is that Michael J. Fox may have actually had uh, a pallidotomy earlier in his life. Um, experimental strategies such as impl implementation or <laughs> implantation, sorry, of stem cells uh, that are programmed to, do to produce large quantities of L-DOPA or dopamine are ongoing. Perhaps eventually we can get to the point where stem cells can replace those cells that are lost in the um, um, basal ganglia. <coughs> so that's Parkinson's disease. Um, Huntington's disease is a neurological disorder characterized by various motor symptoms usually affects about 1 in 10,000 in the United States, and onset tends to occur between ages 30 and 50. It's associated with gradual and extensive brain damage, particularly in the basal ganglia, but also in the cerebral cortex. Uh, this was originally called Huntington's chorea, uh, which is uh, sort of a general, chorea is a general um, description for brain disorders, particularly those in involving um, things like uh, paralysis. This is a chromosomal disease. Uh, with initial motor symptoms including arm jerks and facial twitches. These motor symptoms then progress to tremors and writhing that affect the person's walking, speech, and other voluntary movements. Um, this is also associated with various psychological disorders such as depression, memory impairment, anxiety, hallucinations, poor judgment, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual disorders. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All of this um, can occur rather rapidly. This is a very progressive um, very uh, difficult disease. Um, unfortunately, there is uh, no really known treatment for Huntington's disease. Uh, the best uh, is to have you and your um, partners tested to see if you might be at risk. If both of you are at risk, then um, this may be uh, an indication about um, having children, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll talk about the Huntington's disease uh, chromosome here in a moment. This is what looks, the brain looks like in an individual with Huntington's disease. 
you can see just a massive decimation of the brain, in particular the thalamus and related areas. So pre-symptomatic tests can identify with high accuracy who might develop the disease. Uh, this is controlled by an autosomal dominant gene on chromosome number four. The higher the number of consecutive repeats of the combination of CAG, the more certain and earlier the person is to develop the disease. So this is something that genetic testing can determine. Uh, whether it's something you want to know about ahead of time or not is uh, something to consider. But certainly there are genetic counselors who can um, work with you if this is something that you're concerned about. So you can see here uh, the age of onset and the number of um, CAG repeats um, is uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, that is, the age of onset is much uh, earlier in the more CAG repeats at chromosome number four. <coughs> Tourette's then is uh, characterized by involuntary motor and vocal tics, sometimes cries and vocalizations. In general, this is not the um, Hollywood version of Tourette's. People don't tend to just swear out loud. They tend to be more just outcries um, and involuntary vocalizations. Uh, the uh, Tourette's is treated with dopamine 2 blocking agents such as haloperidol. And Tourette's is much more common in males, and its specific pathophysiology is relatively unknown. Uh, it can be very difficult for people to live with, particularly people who are trying to work, um, go to school, because these are completely out of their control. And so there is uh, an important part of trying to educate the population about this particular disease and to let people know that people with Tourette's just are really pretty normal people who simply have this motor tic disorder. And so it's something we really have to be mindful of. The last major disease I want to talk about is ALS, which is amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. And this is a highly progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. And of course, Lou Gehrig, this is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, this is, of course, the disease that uh, Stephen Hawking suffers from. Uh, the progressive generation, degeneration of motor neurons in ALS eventually leads to loss of voluntary muscle movement. So this is primarily a loss of motor neurons that then leads to the loss of <coughs> the muscles themselves because they are simply uh, atrophied. Uh, familial ALS is associated with only about 5 to 10% of cases. Uh, for these families, there's about a 50% chance of having a child with ALS. So this is, again, an area where uh, genetic testing may be appropriate if it's something you're concerned about. Uh, ALS generally strikes people between the ages of 40 and 70. And importantly, uh, military veterans are more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with ALS. And this is something we're not entirely sure why this occurs. But this is something that's really important that we really must try to figure out um, what is causing this particular disease because it is quite devastating. Um, Stephen Hawking is one of the exceptions uh, to the rule. Most patients would not have lived anywhere near as long as he has. Uh, and, uh, he's obviously had great care as well and has um, is a unique case. Um, but in particular, this is a pretty devastating disease. And so... Uh, hopefully we'll start making some progress in this area. Final thing to talk about in movement disorders are some cortical motor disorders. We talked a little bit about alien limb syndrome, I think, already. This is the feeling that one of our limbs is not our own or moves on its own. Um, so this is oftentimes due to um, damage to the sensory feedback mechanisms. And so um, people feel that one of their limbs is moving on its own and it's not of their own control. And then apraxia, finally, is an inability to perform skilled, sequential, purposeful movement. And this tends to be more common after left hemisphere damage. Um, oral apraxia, which is uh, fa oral facial apraxia, tends to be due to damage to temporal parietal areas. And then limb apraxia tends to be due to parietal lobe damage. Um, this is something that's very difficult oftentimes for people to uh, live with because it can be very debilitating, particularly for limb apraxia. Uh, it's associated with uh, difficulty moving, a difficulty walking, and oral apraxia is difficulty talking um, normally. And so, again, some education about this. Uh, these are individuals with a motor disorder. They aren't developmentally disabled, normal intelligence. It's just simply a motor disorder. So be mindful of that. Anyway, those are, uh, this is a quick introduction to movement disorders. Um, we'll be talking uh, more about uh, issues like this later on in the term.